Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, no word to lie, boys and girls. History matters. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more, and lighten it in a conversational fashion. And you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do, because let's face it, you're listening right now. Uh, and if you are, please subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Give us the old five-star rating on your podcast provider of choice. We're available pretty much everywhere. Places like Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, and plus we archive all of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel, so if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd absolutely appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to check us out on the social media. We're on the Facebook, we're on the Twitter, we're on the Instagram, we're on the Letterboxd, we're on the Tumblr, we're on the TikTok, and, well, we're probably at other places, too. I don't even know at this point. But uh, we're at In the Seats for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In the Seats. In the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because guess what? If, if we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it even more when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please do us that kindness and pay us a visit. On this episode, boys and girls, we got a fun one. We got a good one. It's a little overdue, but it's good. It's an interesting one. Uh, we're talking. Uh, well, about something that's in development. And it's a documentary about somebody who you don't necessarily know about, but should know about. And, and this person's name is Ann Beats. Uh, she was a legendary SNL and National Lampoon writer back in the day. And one of the driving forces of modern comedy as we know it. And I mean... I love, you know, it's it's the stuff that we've all laughed at over the years and enjoyed and sort of, and how it's developed. And, and she is one of those influences in the universe that, uh, you know, most people don't know about, but they know who she's influenced. And that's the kind of person who Ann Beats was. And it's being uh, put together and produced by uh, Solaris Entertainment. Uh, and we had the unique pleasure of talking with Anne's longtime friend and producing partner, Eve uh, Brandstein. Uh, and uh, also, uh, well, a little bit more, too. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's We had we talked with the CEO of the company as well, Mr. Michael Bloom, about getting all of this together and really paying homage to the legacy of... Uh, a, a, a trailblazer in the world of comedy, and uh, I cannot wait to see it when it comes out, but uh, first, enjoy our talk with uh, Michael and Eve, because uh, about Anne, and I mean, I enjoyed it. It's a good conversation, so please listen and enjoy. Well, no, I mean, obviously, just, you know, just to kick this off officially, I mean, both of you, you know, thank you so much for the time today, just uh to talk about uh, Anne and just this project and uh, everything else in between. I really appreciate it. Of course. Well, we're glad you're interested in talking about it, you know. No, for sure. I mean, I guess, Eve, my first question is probably going to be for you. Like, I guess, walk me through sort of uh, meeting Anne, because, I mean, obviously, you, you both worked together for so long. I mean, I'm kind of curious about those early days, like what sort of brought you two together? Well, it was this particular project that she brought to the television community. <laughs> she had a deal with uh, the company that I was working with, which was Norman Lear's production company. Um, and she, I guess it was called Embassy then. And then, and I was a vice president there and I was develop the head of casting of the company. And um, I helped her with her fabulous script, which was Square Pegs. And uh, we met in 81, but we didn't really kick off making the show till 82. And from that point on, we had this enormous relationship. So our initial our initial experience was working on Square Pegs. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, full disclosure, I, I admittedly, I did not know her name. But I mean, when I went and started digging back and doing my research, I'm like, okay. Yeah. Anyone who survived the lampoon years and sort of came out right. of the system and does absolutely deserves my respect. So, I mean, I guess walk me through 
uh, from both your perspectives, uh, who had the light bulb to be like, you know what, this this woman deserves to have her her story told and have a film made about her? Well, I'll leave that with you. <laughs> right ahead, well, yeah, I mean, I met Anne in 1989 when I had uh, developed a pilot with National Lampoon called the Collegiate Comedy Pop Off. It was a uh, a show that we asked Anne to be a judge on, along with Rick Greenstein, who was the head of comedy at William Morris at the time, and Patty Jackson was running Lampoon. Um, Anne and I met then, and we, it seemed like we'd known each other, you know, prior to that, you know, not long lost friends or anything, but we, we had a lot of things in common. We agreed about uh, certain things that uh, most people don't. Um, so we had some real common ground and we, we became, you know, kind of fast friends in a business sort of way. Yeah. We weren't socializing on a regular basis or anything like that. Um, and then my show basically turned into last comic standing and, uh, we got picked up and, you know, you've heard about that. Of course. Um, so I, I was not in touch with Anne on a regular basis. Um, but we did stay in contact loosely. Um, she and Eve had developed some work together uh, a few years back. One was very much based on her experience at Lampoon um, and then Saturday Night Live called The Girl in the Room, which is a wonderful documentary that still uh, needs to be made. Um, however, it was that project that inspired me to think about this documentary in whole. When Anne passed, she passed very unexpectedly, and we were working on another one of their projects called Funny Boys, which we're going to make. Um, it's, I, I, you know, for a quick explanation, it's Seinfeld with a female lead. Okay. Um, she, uh, it, and it's her life, you know, it's about her life all the way through. So it's hysterical in the making, and there's no way it won't be because Anne was brilliant. I mean, and Eve, Eve will talk more about Anne. She knew her the best. Um, but uh, we, we definitely uh, connected on our mutual desire to see that and Girl in the Room, you know, created, produced, and, and distributed properly. And we were preparing to do all those things when she passed away. Now, I mean, I'm curious. Yes. Listen, for, for, for the film, uh, how deep are you going? Because, I mean, just as an ex-Montrealer, to find out she's a McGill alum, I just kind of made me smile mm -hmm. a little bit. How much of, uh, are we just getting those sort of the professional accomplishments, or are you, are you guys really sort of diving deep into who no, she is a human being? You're going to know her, her life as well as her career achievements. And her life was uh, interesting, and she was also, um, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Eve, but she was also as you just said, unknown. She was she was not known by many, despite the the Emmys, despite you know the accolades that she got along with others, she stayed pretty well under the radar. I don't know if that was by design or or what, but she, you know, she later became a mom and she ended up teaching, which uh when we've talked to some of the students she taught, they sing her praises beyond beyond, you know, great. So she she is a She's a role model, but she's also somebody who was a pathfinder. She did things before others were able to do them, and she made sure there was a way to go for them. You know, I think Tina Fey would tell you that for sure. No, absolutely. And I mean, I'm I'm curious because obviously, when we go through the list of her credits, and I mean, there is such a a, a seminal list of what she was involved in from SNL to I mean, even something like the Guild Alive uh, stage show, which was obviously something that was so influential and i mean eve obviously uh you i mean you initially met her sort of just before you know just after that but i mean i'm kind of curious in how big was her life when it comes to sort of it seems like she's very much sort of the forerunner for so many of the the female comics that we have today i mean you brought up tina fey but i mean we can bring up amy and so many others yeah. it really feels like without Anne, we may not have had so many of these greats that we have today well i could speak to the fact that uh, at the time that i met her and most likely much prior to that where we were very few and in between women in the industry in certain capacities and certainly um 
Anne as a humorist was an outstanding example of where you didn't find a lot of women um, from the early days. And because I became such a close friend of hers and we spent so many years professionally, we had a very deep friendship, a very, very um, confident one. And uh, so I got a lot of information over the years about her early life. And that's almost as interesting in some ways as her professional life in her like adventure and her sense of wanting to be, you know, a powerful person in her lifetime and not, not a sort of footnote of a man in her life or, you know, and uh, she's funny, you know, and brilliant. And, and yes, I agree. She is a kind of role model leader for a time that didn't exist and now exists for many women. I mentioned this uh, earlier in another interview that um, several years ago, Vanity Fair did a cover issue with all these women in comedy. And the, the claim was women are finally funny. And Anne took great, <laughs> you know, she was insulted by it. So she wrote a letter. So the next month, Vanity Fair published her letter where she just scolded them for saying, what do you mean they're the first generation of female funny is now it's been here for a long time. Women have been funny a long time. Uh, in our film that we were doing a documentary on one, the girl, in, uh, the girl in the womb, we call it. The title being somewhat repeated for this as well. The okay. girl, the uh, but the yeah, uh, there was this this time when you know the women weren't recognized for it, but they were doing it. And so we go back for a historical context. You know, we really revered. You know that there was comedy, Mae West. Sophie Tucker, you know, you can go on and on, but sure. but in terms of Anne as a producer showrunner, very rare, very rare. In fact, so I can't today, think really, of it. You know, not not enough. You know. So the uh, the idea of doing this film, Michael called me up, and of course, she's two years gone for me. It's a great loss. I lost my my friend, my partner in business, and uh, you know we had a company called B Girls Production, and we did a lot of work together for forty years, and uh, it suddenly was a very emotional possibility and a creative one to consider this and to make it sort of like iconic in a sense. And yes, she's not as known as some, but she's the influence of so many. This really feels like the opportunity to to very much celebrate. And I mean, I can imagine I can imagine you've both you know approached people to to talk about her to be in the film, but I mean, like was there any arm twisting especially when it comes back to trying to get stories out of the old lampoon days or was sort of everyone on board from minute 1? Uh, the second they heard the, that you both were working on this project to be able to talk about AM. Well, I well, think I reached, that, yeah, go ahead. You, go ahead. Well, I reached out to, you know, the people that I feel are very much a part of the circle and most of them are very much on board and that, that's sort of somewhere that I'm at with it. But Michael, you're, you're more in, involved in uh, approaching more celebrities, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the people who are most, uh, I think, uh, important to hear from are, you know, when I reached out to Chevy, for example, uh, I spoke first with his wife and, you know, they were both um, very eager. And Chevy really, he wishes he could apologize for some of the ways that uh, he treated Anne. You know, he wasn't he wasn't kind at all to her at, at Saturday Night Live. You know, John Belushi, who tried to convince her and O'Donohue, but mostly Anne, to come to SNL, tried to get her fired after she was there because she was just so dominant. She was great, you know, and she and John's wife became very close friends. Um, so it was really odd, you know, but, you know, in talking to Lauren and again, Chevy, Lauren, everybody we've reached out to has... Uh, said that they will make time in their schedule or when do you want me? Nobody has said they're not available. Nobody says, no, nah, I'm not interested. Everybody that we're reaching out to understood her strengths and her value to any project she was part of. You know, she wrote some of the best sketches SNL ever did. And I mean, this ad she did for National Lampoon 
that Lampoon was sued over kind of made a statement that was, you know, it's still it's still one of the examples of Lampoon's genius back in the early days. And, you know, I, I work with Lampoon still. I control their catalog. Um, we're doing some new things together. Uh, that's a whole other discussion. But this one ad where a Volkswagen is floating on the water, she writes, if Ted Kennedy, Kennedy only had a Volkswagen. Oh, geez. <laughs> it, was, it was hysterical. And, I mean, they got sued and they paid a lot of money for that ad. But it was effective. And, you know, it, it's one of the things that stands out in those magazine years, you know. She was an influence. She was very much an influence. And I knew that from the time I met her till she passed. Yeah, I did. I called Eve and uh, said, you know, um, we got to do a documentary, you know, about Anne. And A Girl in the Room was really kind of the, the sub subversion of uh, what this is going to be. You know, it's, it's still that story, but so much more. So much for more. sure, for sure, and I mean, it just feels so fitting that you know she she had a moment on Murphy Brown, and she's had moments on, you know, contributing to SNL and so many of these different things. And I mean, I'm curious from your perspectives, is is this one of those unsung Hollywood stories that it really feel that needs to be shared? Because I mean, again, like you said with the Vanity Fair story, it, you know. There was a whole, there were generations of women that were funny before the obvious ones that we have now. This, like, for both of you, this almost feels like, I mean, at least from my perspective, like we're getting a real slice of of Hollywood history that we should know, that maybe we didn't know in the past. Like, how big is it for you to sort of give us this sort of education? I mean, I don't want to say, you know, educational in a didactic way, but it really feels like we're getting a deep dive into sort of the history of comedy with what, you, what you're what you both going to be able to do with this story. It's funny you bring that up because we also have on staff Harmon Leon, who is, uh, he, he is a historian where comedy is concerned. And when we brought him in, uh, we were working on other things together. And we finally invited him to participate in this. And the smile on his face grew ear to ear. You know, and he's a, he's going to be a tremendous contributor uh, to this project. Um, and, you know, I think Anne um, intimidated a lot of men because she was so good and she was so brilliant. Didn't, didn't kind of. She did. Okay. Well, I she should have cut it a bit. No, I meant, that, I meant that as <laughs> the other side of why she's not as well known. Or is, yeah, she wasn't he, liked too for for a minute. Yeah. She was a very controversial character, yeah. and acted out with great aggression at times, rather than being the polite young lady. I think she <laughs> was. A, yeah, yeah. I think that's part of the the charm of this movie too, is to say that her behavior could be one of the reasons that we don't know her as well because she got a little bit sidetracked from. Mm -hmm. The industry so she wasn't celebrated because she had she had a style that was not common or comfortable for men she wasn't a yes man that the, the thing she was never going to be was a yes person you know and took she had a lot of nerve <laughs> yeah she had a well, lot that was of one of the things that was one of the first things we really found ourselves agreeing about we shot that pilot in salt lake city of all places you know and why? Well, because it wasn't L.A. You know, I I moved my family uh, out of L.A. at a very early point of my career because I didn't want to be one of those uh, stereotypical male producers. Right. I've been an advocate for women my entire career. I, I believe women have all the power. I think they're smarter than we are. Oh, amen. And to I don't that. say yeah. that in the embarrassment. I, I just I just, you know. We can't exist, you know, without the women in the world. And, you know, I wish we had a woman president, you know? I mean, Anne was well, one Anne of those forces to be reckoned with. Anne would probably with. disagree. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to make a point of... Yeah, no, the title her, that... Yeah. Her, her character was... She was real smart. So, you know, and, and she was a debater. So she really enjoyed being, you know... A little bit of what I call the the person who asked the other question or had another point of view. Again, behavior that you see commonly in men, such as you know pushing your way into something, 
sometimes or being like less feminine in her style wasn't as acceptable. Was it like, was it wrong? Did it harm her? Yes, it did. Would she have to have done that in this day and age? No, because there's sort of like the door opened wider. It's not necessarily all the way open, but her door, she had to kick the door, so to speak, versus now there's it's an invitation into the room. There's an invitation into being a part of the teams. Sometimes the rooms now are more female, but back then- There's more than were, one, for sure. There's always more than one now. No, absolutely. And I mean, it def- I'm definitely getting the sense that she was someone who- uh, was pretty confident in the fact that she may have been the smartest person in the room and was not afraid to sort of let other people know it, which at that time, obviously, as you said, it was not something sort of the male quotient of Hollywood wanted to hear. And I mean, but it does feel that without Anne sort of ruffling those feathers, we may not have had sort of the more inclusive rooms that we have now. Well, it yes, wasn't an accident that Lorne asked uh, Anne and Tina Fey to write the 25th uh, anniversary special for SNL. You know, two women wrote that. Yeah. You know, that that was a tremendous statement, you know, and Lauren will talk about that, you know, on camera. Um, it, there are things that people don't know about Anne that they will know, and her her victories will be celebrated, I promise. Yeah, there's also the, um, the ad- she was an advocate of women, um, so when I say that, she hired them. She didn't just say it. She actually, her staff sometimes were, for those days, more female than they were male. She also, as you know, was a, a book editor. Or, you know, she put out publications, and one of them was called Titters. Titters, yeah. It was all about women humor, and this was the 70s, you know, so there was some great comedy in there, and uh, she had that vision that, you know, women could have a place at, at this table, so to speak, and they had a voice. And she was a big advocate. Like I said, she always hired a lot of women on her staffs. And um, she was a very loyal person, by the way. I think, you know, in spite of some of the controversy she kicked up as being a little difficult at times, you know, what they call it, aggressive versus assertive, <laughs> uh, she... Uh, she was really a very loyal friend and a loyal associate. I don't say that easily because so much of what the Hollywood scene is like, there isn't a lot of loyalty. And she had a lot of loyalty. She always brought all the people that worked with her before back together again. She, she was very loyal that side in that sense. And, uh, and a big promoter of women. Now, considering the era that she came up in, was it easier to be funny in TV as opposed to, say, film? Or was that just the natural progression? Because, I mean, especially considering the era with people that spun off of Saturday Night Live. I mean, obviously, Anne was one of the few women, but we never saw or heard stories of women transitioning to film. It was always just sort of sitcom or writing jobs or things like that. There was never really a jump to film. Was TV sort of the natural progression from something like Lampoon at the time? Well, I only know that television was a woman's domain. Uh, it always was known as women watch TV. Women right. bought the products that were being sold on TV. You know, the the detergents and the washing and drying things. Like anything that had to do with the household. So it was a woman's place. But. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of film made with women in the uh, forefront. That happened later. You know, what's interesting is Lampoon was offered Saturday Night Live by NBC. Mm. And Beard and Kenny passed because they were they were making movies. They, mm. they were starting to make movies. And, you know, if he had a crystal ball, I'm sure he would have changed his decision. You know, but then again, Saturday Night Live, the first season was nothing but radio hour sketches. National Lampoon Radio Hour sketches, same cast. You know, Lauren got everybody from Saturday Night Live that was doing Radio Hour over. You mm-hmm. know, and who didn't want to do TV? You know, if you're doing radio shows and you're offered an opportunity to be on television, you're not going to take it. Well, of know? course, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Michael and Ann wrote a, a majority of that stuff. So wild. I mean, those those are obviously such iconic. Uh bits and moments that i mean 
have been so influential in the history of comedy. And I mean, just to start putting a bow on this for both of you, where do you think her legacy stands, especially when it comes into the history of modern comedy? Because the more I've dug into her and her past, it's, it, this definitely feels like a movie that I'm looking forward to seeing. But I mean, I think so many people out there will want to see as well, because again, this is one of those stories that has been influential, but could serve to continue to be so much more influential down the road once people see the film. I think that uh, I think she, her name belongs right next to people like Penny Marshall, you know, um, and Lucille Ball. You know, Lucy was so much smarter than anybody ever knew. Right. But uh, but Penny is the is probably the one that most of us are familiar with, and uh, she was also very aggressive in in the way she wanted things done. Um, I think people will know Anne in a whole different light when we're done with this. And I wouldn't be surprised if a feature film, uh, you know, a theatrical type of film is is created as a result or just because she she was a game changer. She was definitely somebody who changed the face of comedy in America. Is that a spoiler or a promise? Pardon me? Is that a spoiler or a promise? I don't know. I I can't I can't know because <laughs> I'm not the one who would make the movie. That that's not my cup of tea. I do television and I love it. You know. So well, you know, I'm glad it is the cup of tea for both of you because I mean, honestly, I'm really looking forward to this, and I think a lot of people, once it gets to on more and more people's radars, are really going to be excited about this. But I mean, to you both, just thank you for the work, and I mean, thank you for the time today. I really well, I want to thank you, David. It was lovely. Thank yeah, you. I want to thank uh, and make it known that Anne Anne's daughter Jaylene is is helping us with this, and will continue to do so in a in a very big way. Um, I'm very grateful to her support as well. I, I know Eve agrees with that, um, but she's uh, she's very well unknown intentionally. She doesn't want to be out there in front of anything, but she's a very bright young woman and. Her help is uh, very, very much appreciated. Well, comedy is a family affair and it's born out of love. And I mean, I appreciate the love that you have for this. And I mean, again, just thank you for the work and thank you for the time today. Thank uh, you. Our pleasure. All right. My pleasure. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.